five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the Getting Real with Rael podcast, where we get raw, real, and brutally transparent so you can be the best version of you. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. Now, let's kick it off with your host, Rael Andrews, a.k.a. Coach. Five, four, three, two, one, boom. What's up, champions? Coach Rail here with Getting Real with Ray Al, where we get real, raw, brutally honest, and transparent so you can be the best version of yourself. Uh, before I introduce my guests, I always I want to give a special shout out to all my single moms out there. I will fight for you so that you can move better, be better, have more, and be your God given talent. Why? I got your back. Why? Because God's got my back. Let's go change the world together. So anyways, I'm excited. I got a guest here. My GH champions are going to be excited about this. We have Marcus Coloma. Did I say that right? Coloma? That's right, man. Awesome. Coloma. Awesome. Yes. Coloma. Coloma. It's like, it's almost like, it's almost like my favorite show. Do you remember Colombo? Did you ever see Colombo? <laughs> absolutely dude love that show it's great dude, i told you know I told yeah you. man that great show yeah so listen so I, um it's really cool so marcus what we do on here before we get to all the good stuff we we go right back we jump right into it like i say we get raw brutal you know brutally transparent because as i shared with you on the set the other day it's really about helping other champions to know that it's not all like rosy up here for all of us. And we like, we get, we get right into it. So take us back to the five-year-old Marcus. What was it like growing up? Were you a single kid, a big family? Did you grow up on the, the nice side of the tracks, the bad side of the tracks? Kind of give us the quick 411 bringing us forward to today. Okay, great, man. Uh, also, thanks for having me, man. That intro was so awesome, dude. That it, it, it's it all looks so cool, uh, and I love what you're doing here, man. Um, but yeah, so five years old, I just moved to California from Utah. I, you know, my parents uh, didn't. I wouldn't say they were, you know, I, I, we definitely weren't wealthy. Um, but we, we always kind of lived in, in the boonies. And so it never, you know, I never really felt wealthy or poor because there was a lot of outdoor activities, but you know, they, it, we were like a one car family. And so I would say probably skewed on the, the, you know, young parents making ends meet type of deal. But, but the good thing is, is they were together and they had a lot of love and my dad was an athlete. Um, and so you know, he always kept me active and uh, and moving around a lot. And I think there was just a lot of exploration because I, I was in the mountains of, of Northern California. And I, I don't know, it was just kind of like an, it was like an adventure. And it, it didn't I think being in L.A. or in a city and and not having money would be you would you'd be very aware of that, you know, because you see your friends driving certain cars where. Man, like a brand new Civic in my hometown would have been a fancy car. You know what I mean? Like if, if a family had like a brand new car, you'd be like, whoa, man, look at these guys. So I, I never really felt that mattered in, in, in any way, which was great. It was really just about like, who are you? My dad was an incredibly friendly guy and would say hi to everybody and would help all of the kids, what, whatever side of the track they were on. And I, and I, and that would, he was just kind of respected as a really good guy. And my mom was also just a, a caring mom. She worked at, uh, at home, but they were really young. My mom was 21 when she had me. They were 19 when, when they had my brother. So it was a lot of love, but, but there was also, I think, a youth to them, you know, and, and figuring things out. I had, a, I had an older brother. I still have an older brother. I have two younger sisters. But when I was five, I would have had an older brother and a younger sister. And I just... I don't know, man. I was just kind of always off in my own world, doing my own thing. I think, I think mom was busy cooking and cleaning and my dad was busy at work. And so there was a lot of, uh, imagination games that we would play like superhero stuff and, and, you know, running around. 
That's awesome. So what was speaking to that? So I love that. It kind of reminds me of when I was for four years of my life, my mom had me at a foster family, if you will. And it was some of the best memories of my life. Wow. And it was, yeah. Yeah. And it's the same thing. We did a lot of uh, imaginary stuff. You know, I remember as a kid, like big things for me were like riding the bike, you know, hockey cards, Legos, building forts, collecting base. So you kind of just brought me back uh, a little bit there. Now, what, like, when did you, uh, at what time did you figure out you were going to be an actor? Not, not till later. I was probably 18 years old. I, um, in hindsight, I think I always wanted to. I just didn't know. But I would see a movie and then I would want to be – if I'd see a cop movie, I'd want to be a cop. If I saw a firefighter movie, I'd want to be a firefighter. But then it took me until I was 18 that I realized, no, I think it's like – it's an acting. I was really I was really shy and I would just – I just thought the idea of being somebody else where somebody gives you the lines and something to say because I remember, you know, when you really – I'm not this way anymore, but when I was younger, I was really shy. And so it was like, I could never, I would go blank. I wanted to talk to people, but I couldn't remember anything. I couldn't think of anything to say. So I think just the idea of having a character that you could play that is different than who you are and that set and has something to say was very interesting, you know? It, it, like what I'm hearing you say and champions, it, there is a little bit of, but it's okay. It's like almost like the, it's almost like... <laughs> You'll laugh at this, Marcus. Like when I ask you a question, there's a little bit of a, a delay, but it's it's kind of cracking me up because it's like talking to Maurice. Because, you know, <laughs> like when you talk to Maurice, he's got that, you know what I mean? He's got like that. And then he says, so, but it's all good. It's, I'm, so, I'm getting it on my end too. It's a little bit of a lag. Uh, I wonder if I take this out, but then I think it's going to echo. So I don't know. I don't know. Maybe try try see what happens. You take it out for a sec. Oh my God, that's so much better, dude. Are we working? Do we got echo? Oh no, that's beautiful. That's so so much better. Okay, so great, much better. dude. Great, great, great. All right, so um, because I'm going to edit. So we're back, guys. We uh, we had a little technical difficulties, but it was worth the wait. We're back, and so we were just talking about um, you know, when you um discovered or, or first learned that you want to be an actor, but you know, I, the next what, what do you remember like coming up as a kid, Marcus? What was your, and I love the name, by the way. I didn't know if you know this, but my son's name is Marcus. Oh, wow. You yeah. know what's cool about that? If you were to see a picture of my dad, yeah, you guys look a, a lot alike. Really? Like, yeah. Yeah, he's oh got a God. shaved head. He's like, he's a he's a big athletic guy, dude. Like, yeah. Very, the, the first day I saw you, I was like, wow, that's crazy. That guy looks like my dad. <laughs> I did, I'll, show, I'll show you a picture when I get to GH. No, yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. So what was your, coming up as a kid, what do you remember, if anything, was one of the biggest challenges in your life? You kind of mentioned being shy or something, but do you ever, like, were you, like, do you have any big challenges coming up that you had to, to overcome or work through? Yeah. I mean, look, I think, I think one was, one was being ethnic in a, in a school that was very, very Caucasian. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and it, it wasn't necessarily, it was just difficult in the sense that you were, you were just, it's just, you're just different. You know what I mean? You're always different. And, and that was a challenge because also, you know, my dad is from Hawaii. And so there are just culturally different things. Like he didn't, we didn't wear shoes in the house and we'd be, you know, like pokey, which is now f like pretty famous in Los Angeles, raw fish and all of that stuff. They're I'm just going little... for that right after this. Oh, you're kidding me. So yeah. that, that, that was something I had seen as a young kid, but nobody, uh, no other family is, is doing that kind of stuff. And, and it, again, my dad and my parents were so great. So it wasn't, it wasn't like, uh, you know, it, it, it was just, there was just this kind of like figuring things out and, and trying to adjust, I guess, to that, it's, it was just a very different place where my family was from and our, I think our kind of culture, which was kind of a hybrid of, of the Hawaiian culture. And then, you know, kind of a, a, a mountain, very white culture, but so there was that. And then definitely the shyness I would say was, that was the hardest thing I dealt with for sure. Right. And 
what do you think attributed to that shyness? I think there was just, uh, it's a good question. I got to think about that for a second. Um, I think there's a couple of things that attributed to the shyness. One is because my, my house was very different than anybody else's that I had been to. You know what I mean? And again, it wasn't that I'm not talking the racist people doing things like that against us. It was just different. And like, like we would say different words There would be different words for things. And it kind of just immediately creates this gap between you and somebody else's house. You know, like you go to somebody else's house and it's, you're just kind of unfamiliar with what's the protocol here. You know, like we take our shoes off and you guys don't do that. So I think part of it was just, there's kind of this different language, almost like a language barrier, even though it, it was very slight. I think part of it was, um, you know, my house, these are so, I, I haven't really thought about this and I'm sure I could articulate this better, but my house totally okay to eat with your hands. We would have rice with every meal you're eating with your hands. Like in another house, that stuff is, you know, yeah, that's, that, that's like spinning like, in somebody's face, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They'd be like, dude, that's really weird. Uh, like, uh, yeah. Like, exactly. yeah. Like, so your girlfriend is like, probably got to, like, okay, I'm bringing you home tonight. So here's the way it goes. Totally, right? man. And so, wow. uh, there, there was just that immediate disconnect of this is different. I'm not really sure what's cool. What's not cool. And then I think what I was struggled with for a very long time is it took me a while to realize that the majority of people don't care what you say. The majority of people just want to talk. And you might say something that's not the most impressive thing in the world, but the majority of people are going to hear you and they're going to like, they're going to, they're going to contribute something else to the conversation. And I think I was a perfectionist in a lot of ways. And so I was trying to think of perfect things to say, and there would never be the perfect things to say. Um, and I think I would just kind of like, I was just so in my head about so many things. I didn't understand what was valuable and what made somebody intelligent or smart or funny. And, and I think that's a huge reason why I dove into movies because I was, I was, I would say I was semi-literate until I was about 23 years old. I just, wow. I would try to read and I couldn't read. I couldn't understand what I was reading. And so the way that I learned about relationships was through movie and television and, uh, you know, like Adam Sandler, that whole SNL crew really, I think had a huge impact on me because here are these guys that are just screaming at the top of the lungs and just very, you know, Chris Farley was just so big and it was funny and you would see people universally, whether this person was a different culture or whatever it was universally. I found that there was a universal language that, that if you kind of communicated effectively, it didn't really matter what you were doing. It was almost like how you were doing. It was more important than what you were doing and saying, you know, mm, totally. Now you said something, Marcus is interesting to me because I know like you were, you said you're a perfectionist. Now yeah. I'm, I'm curious because I know for me, um, I, I very much, you know, my dad always taught me, he said, son, he would always say to me this. He, there's like a few things my dad would always say. He'd say, number one, he'd say, there's no such word as C-A-N-T. I erase that word. Then he, then he would always say to me, he said, son, I don't make excuses. I don't take them. Not even good ones, not even justified ones. But the one thing he'd always say to me, and he'd always make me answer, even though I knew the answer already, because once he taught me, he said, he said, do everything with excellence. Why, son? Why do we do everything with excellence, son? And I go, because it has our signature on it, Dad. How do we want to be remembered? What kind of legacy do we want to leave? What do we want on our tombstone? What do we want people to say? So I always had this mentality to do things with excellence, which is a perfectionist. Mm. Now, I remember, Marcus, about may, maybe um, maybe five years now, six years, I was, I was working with a lady, Susan Sly. I'm an entrepreneur, and, and I was becoming a digital marketing coach at the time, helping her with her agency. And I was on a training, 
And she said something, and it was such a God drop, Mark, because I literally, I still have it written up on my wall. I took a big red pen, and she said this to me. She said it to, I heard it to me, right? So you know what I'm saying? when you? Oh, that was, yeah, yeah, it just hit you, oh, right? I got that, right? Yeah. She said, it's going to be messy. And I was like, because do you, I'm sure you can relate to this as a perfectionist. I'm sure you, there were so many things that I had that I hadn't finished because it wasn't perfect yet. It wasn't right. But now when she said that, it released me. And dude, my career, my life just took off because wow. it's like, I just get it done. It's going to be messy. Just do it. It's going to be messy. You're going to make it better. Yeah, man. Well, getting it done right there, I feel like that's a lesson is just get it done, dude. Just get it done. And, and, I, and my first acting class, which I hated because they were like, don't audition for two years because you're not ready. Worst school ever. Worst advice oh ever. Gosh. I know. Because you do the two-year program, you go on, on your first audition and you're so scared and you're starting from beginning. And, and there's so much to be said to just doing things and making a mess and then you do it again and it gets better. And sometimes the mess is incredible, you know? So... I agree with that big time. I think, you know, that perfectionism, it can be a really big block and prevent you from doing so many things, you know, mm -hmm. instead of just doing it, messing up and then doing it again and then messing up and doing it again, you know? Yeah. And what I'm, what I'm also thinking, one of the things that really attracted you to me and, and, you know, Maurice confirmed it is everything I love is how young are you? I'm not that young. I'm 42. 40, oh God, I was just talking about this. 42 or 43, one of those. I love that, I love that you don't remember. Well, I'm 59, so you're a little okay. younger than me. Okay, okay. But even at 42, what I love about you is you, it, you, like, you remind me of, like, you know, well, Maurice, obviously, he's my BFF, but you're, like, another young actor. I don't know if you've met, actually, wait a sec. He, he was, no, he was lucky for a while. Did you ever meet Jacob Young? Did you ever get a chance no, to meet him? No, I never met him. Yeah. He's another one. It's like, you guys get it. Like, I, the first thing you said to me is, you're always, you want to do more. You're always doing something. You're not like, you're not like comfortable here. You're not like, and, you know, as, as a entrepreneur, as a, somebody who's had a little bit, I, I'm so passionate about fitness professionals specifically and my acting peers, peers, because, dude, if you're not having multiple things going on, you're not setting yourself up for success. You know, I, I hate to say it. I hope and I pray General Hospital goes on long after I'm here. But, you know, but to put all our eggs in one basket is not smart. Let's just keep it real. It's just not. And I like how you're doing this. You got your music going. You got this going. It. You're doing everything. You're smart enough to see that. Be grateful for what you got. And the bigger thing that I mean, have you recognized, Marcus, that that you have a voice? It's not about you know. I, I'll never forget. Uh, here's what I'm saying with this. I'll never forget. This was in one of those aha uh -huh moments. Um, I had a new person. I do the, the network marketing thing, and I had a person on my team. He's actually he's actually ABC. You might he's the um, he's the sportscaster um, for the ABC News. I'm Kurt Sandoval. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, right. And um, he was on my team back back in the day, and he had a very successful gym out here. Um, and I just come in, he told me I could come in and I put up all these different banners that were helping to promote our company and everything. And I'll never forget this. You know, when you have these moments when people say, and you're like, Oh, well, that just changed my life forever. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and, and I walk into the gym and he says to me, he goes, and we're still getting to know each other. Right. I don't really know him that well yet. And he says to me, it's not about you and me, you know that right Right. And I go, yeah, yeah, of course. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> right? And he says, yeah. he says, it's not about me being a successful sportscaster on ABC and you being an actor and you being a seven-figure income earner with this network marketing company and you and, and me having this big successful gym chain and everything. It's about how many people we bring home when it's all said and done. Mm. And I was like, wow. Mm. So... And now, fast forward to now, what I've learned that to be, Marcus, it's our voice. What are we called to do? Who are we called to, to, you know, to share? Have you 
recognize that? Have you walked into that? Do you know that you're more than just an actor on General Hospital, a musician that God is putting you or whatever you believe in is putting you on this platform that you can make a difference, that it's not about Marcus? Yeah, you know, funnily enough, I would say in the last, I would say in the last six months, because there would be moments, uh, like there's one guy who is a buddy of mine, couldn't get in a relationship, just couldn't couldn't figure out the relationship, couldn't figure out his, he was doing a career, he didn't like his career. And I was working with him, and in a couple of years, he's married now, he's got his dream gig, well, it, he's on his path to, and there, so there have been a couple of, there have been a couple of moments like that where I, I felt like I had really helped and impacted somebody's life. You know what I mean? And, and, and I felt that, that rush and satisfaction of when you really impact and you really help change somebody's life. And, and it was so much more gratifying than any TV show or paycheck that I'd ever gotten. Right. There was nothing like that moment of someone sincerely being like, wow, you really, you had an impact, you know? And then, for some reason in the last, I would say six months to a year, it's just been happening more frequently. And I don't know if that's because I'm older now and, mm -hmm. and maybe now more people, I think as you get older, somehow people start to ask you advice. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I think, especially if you're, you're kind of succeeding in, in whatever you want to do. And, but yeah, I, this year I would say more than ever also have a 13 year old daughter who, wow. as you know, you really feel the weight of that responsibility when you have a kid asking you advice. That's big advice. You know what I mean? Like, like, like how do you deal with this situation and how did you deal with that? And what if this is happening and you really see that it's really important to be, I think a man for me at least that is trustworthy and that's, that's willing to help because I think so many people out there need help. And so, yeah, funnily enough, I would say in the last six months to a year, I've really, really uh, come to that. But, you know, I was an altar boy when I was a kid. So I've always mm. felt that passion. Mm. Actually, maybe that's the difference is I feel like I'm more equipped to help people now than I was when I was younger, where when I would try when I was younger, I just didn't really know it's hard to tell somebody how to do an exercise that you don't know how to do yet. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Well, and we can relate as an actor, you know, that's when you, because it's, it, we live in an industry, you know, and I keep it real. My champions that, that know me, I mean, dude, I was, dude, I was narcissist king of the world, dude. I mean, it was all about me. I, 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 you know, my wife used to say that to me, dude, you're just like the biggest narcissist ever. When I was like, what is, what are you talking about, dude? I mean, that's, you know, so it's really easy for, uh, excuse me, easy for us to, 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 because, because it is an industry where it definitely feeds that, right? You know, you come in, you go to makeup, you go to hair, you know, everybody's telling you, you look good, you know, that, you know, and, and I think it's important that we have something, whether it's your, your religion or, you know, whatever you're into that, 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 that helps you. Cause I know like now, cause I get this question all the time you know, or I have recently anyways, if you could go back real and tell the younger real, what would you tell if you were to do something different, you know, and, and, and hands down, it would be, I wish I would have known way, way back then. It wasn't about me. Wow. That's interesting. You know, I, you know, I was just thinking about this the other day. I think this industry is tricky that way because you are the product. And so in a way, for me, the whole, the whole thing that kept me in the game was like, if I can just improve, if I can just improve, like I didn't get that, that audition. Okay. Well, what can I do to improve? Okay. Maybe I can work on my emotions. Okay. I can work on my comedy. I can go to the gym. And so it's weird because you get rewarded for self-improvement, but it really is all about you. And, and that's another thing that's happened recently too, where it's like, and honestly, part of that is just because this is, I've, I've worked a lot in the past, but you know how it is. Like you could work and make good money for a month, but that might be the only job you work that for that year. So now yeah. that, 
you made, you know, $50,000 on a gig, but $50,000 for a year or maybe even a year and a half or two years, it's not a it's lot nothing, of money. nothing, especially in LA. It's not yeah. Like, maybe so, we go south, but not here. Yeah. And so it was like for so long, I would have a hard time making relationships work or, or anything work because I was like, I have to improve. I've got to improve. And so it was, it was all about me. And then I finally got a, a gig that's now consistent and I've been, I've gotten the luxury to be like, okay, it's not just clawing. Do you know what I mean? And just mm -hmm. trying to like, cause it's also hard to have relationships as an actor. I think if, if you're working and if you're not working, cause if you're not working, you don't really have the money to take the girl out. And if you are working, you're not really seeing her. If you're like filming a show in Miami or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So it's an, it's an interesting industry, but what I think is cool about it is universally, I would say guys like you and Maurice and me, because you're so constantly working on yourself and human behavior and relationships, I think eventually you get to a point and you say like, wow, it's not about me. It's about other people. But I feel like, you know, you work on communication, you work on all of these things so that when you come to that place, I think it's one of my strongest points as a dad is that I've studied so many different types of characters and different relationships and people and what that when my kid asks me something, I feel, I feel like I can give her a decent answer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now you say, now I'm, I'm picking up. Are, are you a single dad? I, we are divorced, okay. but, but mom is very much in her picture and I'm very much in her picture. And, okay. and we have that rare, beautiful thing where it's a very amicable divorce. We're very friendly. We love each other. And, uh, it didn't work in that capacity, but we're very much team parenting, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and I'm proud of you as a man because the, the statistics of, uh, uh, father being absent in a man, in a, in a young boy or a, a daughter, especially a daughter, um, is, is mind boggling, dude, about like where the kids end up and, you know, the, it, it's so, and I'm proud of you for, you know, stepping up and, and, and manning up and taking action. And it's awesome that you guys have a great relationship, but you still don't, it, that's a choice to be around and be present. Like Thanks, you are. Man. So, yeah. So I'm proud of that. Do you, do you think Marcus, like, I'm always curious, um, you know, you see it in sports. The best baseball players are from third world countries, soccer, third world countries. You know, it's like I, I kind of laugh now because, you know, I'm blessed and when I was coming up. And, you know, of course, as a parent, you want the best for your kids. But it's like, I mean, I remember my, my cousin be, became uh, almost a pro soccer player. He lived in Jamaica. I mean, I remember going to Jamaica back in the day watching my cousin junior play soccer with a freaking coconut okay like you know i mean it's these amazing. kids learn baseball with a stick and a rock and then our kids want to learn baseball and we take them to 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 you know walmart to get a bat and they're like no 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 daddy <laughs> we need to get the super aluminum <laughs> titanium extra ten thousand dollar bat <laughs> So I come on, you know, I can hit it harder, right? And it's like, so it's not surprising to me the best. And it's like, as I hear your story and, you know, your dad's from Hawaii and you come from a different culture and, you know, I come from the other side of the track. I mean, I ran, I mean, I literally, I keep them here, Marcus. These are my original dreams to get out was to make it to the Olympics. These are my first pair of tracks shoes. You can see the, the grass is still on them. Wow. I ran barefoot. Till I was wow. in grade seven. Wow. Because my mom couldn't afford to get me, you know, shoes. And, you know, you know Maurice's stories. You know, a lot of the real successful people, dude, they come from struggle. And I think it, we, we, we just, I don't know, dude. I'm always curious. Like, do you think that's why you're not just, okay, I got a job, man. I'm comfortable now. You're like, it's inheritance to you to not be comfortable, to always be wanting more, to always, what do you think? That's great, dude. That's a great question. And, uh, you know, my, I think, I think what came to my mind when you were talking about that is I think when you don't have a lot, right, of material stuff, and I, and I really want to underline my parents were amazing because my dad, what my dad came from, man, that, that was brutal. And, you know, but I think what it is when you don't have 
the luxury of those things is, and this is going to get a little spiritual, but I feel like, you know, there's something, and this is what's to me at drew me to acting was the idea that the spirit is senior to the physical universe. And I remember I saw Mission Impossible when I was uh, in 12th grade, and I was just really frustrated with the physical universe at that point. Everything, like including my own body, like because I wanted to be an athlete and I was, I wanted to be taller, I wanted to be faster, you know what I mean? And yeah. you can't change your body, you know, you just can't at a certain point. I remember I used to dream about getting like a leg surgery and, and extending my legs so <laughs> I could be taller. Oh, dude, wow. I was because while we, what we would play a lot of, we play a lot of sports, man, because there wasn't a lot to do up there. But then I remember seeing this movie. And I remember being transported to this different world. And I was like, man, that's incredible. But then I thought about it and it's not like that world actually existed. That was just a world of imagination. And I think what happens when people don't have a lot, it's like your friend, he created a, a soccer ball out of a coconut. You know what I mean? Just like, just like, you know, in Star Wars, George Lucas created a spaceship out of wood and some paint and some costumes and some guys with imagination. And I think, you know, you don't depend. I think the physical universe can be a trap. And I actually think it's a blessing if you don't have that stuff mm -hmm. because, you know, I think, you look at iPads and all of this stuff and it re what it does is it can reduce a person's willingness to put out effort. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you don't have anything like sit in a room without an iPad or anything, you're gonna be like, let's go for a walk. Let's go do something. You know, you unplug the TV. My mom used to take the TV and she literally, I remember Kent would come home from school in summer. TV was unplugged and outside and she'd be like, no, nah, you guys are like getting out there. And we, I, my backyard was a national forest and I would just go, explore man and i would climb trees and i'd look out and i would dream and it and your world and your dreams and your vision became much more interesting than any like gadget or screen that's in front of you you know so because i've also seen i've i, I have friends that were privileged it's not not in the mountains but when i came down to la and i was really surprised because some of the most talented guys they had they you know their dads were wealthy and blah, blah, blah. I was like, that's really interesting. So I was like, I don't think what I, my personal opinion is the physical universe stuff doesn't, isn't the factor. It's, it's, it's the spiritual drive of the person, what they want. And some people, they just want more, man. They want to help more people. They want to touch people. They want to communicate, you know, and some people are very happy just kind of like, chilling and and mm -hmm. i also realized that's cool man it's like mm -hmm. whichever way you want to go for me personally i love to be moving i love to be growing i love to have these conversations i love to talk to maurice about his ideas about acting and 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 the mind and and human behavior and i love i love going for walks with my daughter and we just talk about her opinions on different things and that's just for me the thing that really inspires me and, and gets me to go. And, and that if I would have been raised with a lot of money, I don't, I probably would have been different. And I think I probably would have been a little bit lazier. And because honestly, even today, if man, if I get, if I get a little too comfortable, I'm eating ice cream in front of the TV with the cat. You know what I mean? Like I would <laughs> just loaf, dude, you know? Oh man. I hear you. Now, you know, you mentioned, I'm curious, because, you know, Maurice is, I, I don't know if you know that about me, but I know, you know, Maurice, we're big time advocates for mental wellness. Um, is that part of your life? Is it something you personally dealt with? Is it in your family? Um, anything on the mental wellness world? Yeah, I, I really believe that a person is a spirit. So I don't necessarily... I, I believe that a person is a spirit, and I feel like... Um, there's a lot of factors. It's huge. First of all, like mental, the state of mind to me is key. And it's like, you could, you, and I've done this, you can work out all day. So your body is just super in shape, but you can't do anything. You know what I mean? Cause you're not in the right mindset. Um, 
Whereas if you can get your mind right, it's incredible what people can do and what, what lengths they can go to. I met a lady, she was a house cleaner who literally did, I think she would run hundred mile marathons. Wow. And I, and they would be like uphill. And I was like, wow, dude. And she's like, yeah, she's like, it's just totally mind over matter, you know? And, and I'm a big believer in that. And I think it has to do with being surrounded by positive people and vibes and finding out what your personal goals are surrounding yourself with people that help you achieve those goals and getting rid of people that speak against those goals. Mm. Um, and I think it's a constant, constant fight. It's not like, okay, good. Now I'm good. It's literally every single day, you know, whatever that, that thing is for you. So for me, it's kind of like going to bed early, waking up early, uh, making sure that I leave my phone outside of my bed, my bedroom when I go to bed. So I'm not looking at it when I go to bed. Like I have my own personal methods that I do to keep my mind right. Um, but, but again, the importance of having good people around you. Like I remember I got recast this year because of COVID and I got, you know, I got recast one. one oh yeah. You too. Yeah. You too. Yeah. Four times. Dude, that messed with me so much, uh -huh. so much. And I had to talk to, uh, I talked to Steve Burton about it at the time and he really helped me out a lot. Yeah, he, 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 like, he was awesome. He was great. And so it's so important to have those people around you that remind you that you are bigger than this physical world. You know what I mean? Oh my gosh. It's so, dude, that, we have on the show, that's Kyle when we get the, the you've, you've had several, but I was so focused on what you're saying. I forgot about the cowbell. But that, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that it, it really does, man. It's I, you know, for me, I'm a recovered addict and I remember step three of going through the program and it was a game like step three. I used to sit in that room, Marcus, and I, I, the steps were up on the wall and step three is basically in a nutshell, God's got it. You, you, you completely hand it over to God or your higher power, whatever, you know, they say God, or there was actually a big red thumbtack in the ceiling of our wall. And they would be like, if that's your God, if that's your, whatever it is for you, right. There's love there's that. No, yeah. So whatever it is for you, this, I remember it was like a big red thumbtack like this. Right. But, and I used to, you know, I'm a believer. My God is God, you should, but it's you, whoever your God is. And I used to sit there cause you know, I'm very competitive. Right. You know, it's like, you know, like you say to me, everything's a race. Every day is a race. It's the Super Bowl every day. You're going to, there's no second place. It's win. And then if I don't win, my hat's off to you. And then I'm going to go to work and work harder and beat you the next time. You know, that's, that's kind of yep, my mindset. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Right? And uh, I remember watching that and I would be sitting in the room and these people would be like, oh man, step number three, dude. That was the hardest thing I ever had to do. Oh my God. I don't want to do step number. And I'm looking at it and I'm going like, Dude, I got this one, dude. I'm gonna crush it, dude. What the one? Except all I gotta say is God's got it. I, I'm a believer since I was in my 20s. I got this one. Right? And then so when it was time my time to do step three, I'm like, yes. Because to me, it was like full transparency. It was like, yes, it was an important part of my journey, but it was like, I'm gonna ace this test. You know what I mean? I'm gonna get an A on this test, right? And so he gets what he said. He says, so do you, we do this stuff and all this stuff. And he says, so do you believe that, that God's got it? Yep, I do. Wow, man. And he, and he looks at me and he goes, do you really believe that God's got it? And I'm like, yeah, I do. I've, I've been a believer since I was 27. And then he asked me the third time and he was like, now I'm getting pissed, right? Because I'm like, dude, am I speaking Japanese over here? Would you not understanding me? I said, yes, right? And then, but basically I failed because he said, you need to go spend some more time on this. So now, now I'm like pissed, right? I mean, I'm like, what, what, what just happened, right? But long story short, what happened is he planted the seed. And I started to think about it and I realized that, no, I didn't really believe that God's got it. I was praying, I was going to church, I was worshiping, I was kumbaya, all the great stuff and everything like that. But at the end of the day, Rails got it. Mm, you know what I mean? Mm. It wasn't like I wasn't really turning it over. Mm. And when I finally did it, dude, it was so freeing. And even now it's like, I don't, 
I mean, there's so many things that are changing now. And I always have to say to people listening, because when you say your higher power has got it, it doesn't mean you hang out on the lawn chair. Yeah, my God's got it. I'm just going to get mm, back. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm do nothing, right? But, you know, we still got to go to work. But like, it's like you say, it's like it, there's something to. And that was one of the every now and then you get tested. Right. And mm. for me, like you, that was dude. that first time I tested positive and I got recast, dude, I unraveled. Like, dude, I was losing all. Yes. Life, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, like, yeah. And then what happened? All of a sudden, Ray Al's got it because if I, you know, oh, my God, what, 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 what? And then I had to get to that spot. So I totally can relate what you said, dude. It's like, it's it's a cool place to be in, right? But it's like you say, it's a daily. Daily, daily, battle. daily, daily. And, and that's where it's like, I've realized you won't get that. You don't get that. You don't get that faith and confidence from a job. You don't get it from, it, it, it comes from, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. It comes from, we have a saying, Marcus, you might dig this. We have a saying in the program, the longest journey you'll ever take is that 17 inches from your heart to your brain. (laughs) Because when it comes into your brain or heart or your gut, and if you think about it, how many times, have you made a decision from your gut or your heart and it's been right every time and how many times by the time it gets to your well what if oh no maybe not you know in the brain and then you make a a decision from the brain yeah it's usually wrong in the end yeah right yeah that that longest we say that longest journey you'll ever take is you just gotta uh, man it's so cool I, i love i love that what, what, now, what was your first break as an actor? Like you said, you, you, what first your- break was this commercial. It was this, it was a Coke commercial. And, uh, I thought my buddy was like, you're going to make, you're going to make like a hundred thousand dollars on this. And I was like, really? He's like, dude, easily. He's like, you said it's Coke, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like hundred K easily. I, I was working at a gym, a front desk. I quit my job. And, uh, it was, it turned, so we do this massive, it was massive. It was on WB. It was on the Warner brothers lot. Friends cast was eating lunch, like, like at the same place that I was eating. I'm like, this is it. This is it, baby. I'm done. (laughs) Cut to it's a Spanish market only. I made $5,000 and SAG dues, I think are like, I don't remember, but I feel like they're like $5,000 or Mm $3,000. And, you know, there's tax as an agent. And that that was my first big break because it at least made me SAG. But I was working back at the gym like by Friday. (laughs) (laughs) And luckily me and the gym owner, we were close because I did it with some attitude. I was like, dude, I'm out of here, bro. I quit. (laughs) And but we were friends, and so he gave me my job back. But that was humbling, and I realized, oh my god, that is journey, awesome! Man. So you yeah. like literally said, yeah, yes, you, yeah, totally, dude, totally, <laughs> yeah. And I've and I've I've had to do that several times, unfortunately, like that walkout of like I'm free, and then you guys still hiring? Oh What's god. the deal? Yeah, what about you? Know. What was your first big break? Oh, do you know my well, my first. Big break, funny was, uh, it was a, a movie called Harry Tracy, Last Desperado. And um, I had no desire to be an actor at the time. I was the jock. I actually dated the da- drama queen. Okay. And Holly, Holly, yeah, Holly. And I used to like go to her drama practices and stuff because I wanted to get some action, but I was like, oh, that's the stupidest. Thing. I was like, oh my God, I got to watch like those plays that they all do in high school. You know? Were you ever interested or the whole time you were like, no, wow, I was not interested at all. And, huh. and so Hollywood West was now, they were starting to make a lot of movies in Canada because they had a huge tax break. And so they needed a young black kid. Check this okay. out. This was 1981. They needed a young black kid. And I grad like you. I graduated from a class of twelve hundred. I was the only African American, so I could totally oh, relate. Oh wow! To what you were okay, gotcha. Yeah. Earlier, and so they went around to the different high schools, and they found three of us, and they brought us into. I did. I didn't have a clue what I was doing, dude. They gave me these lines. I read these lines. I don't know what it was, and I got the part. Wow. Yeah. Man. But but here, Craig, check this out. So 
So I'm sitting, I'm sitting, I had hair back then, right? I'm sitting in the makeup chair. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm sitting in the makeup chair. <laughs> they're, they're making me blacker because I'm not black enough, right? They couldn't get a black, so they make me black. Oh my gosh. Right? And so like, in comes this guy in the middle of my makeup session. He's, he's about the same height as me, he's white. And they come and say, hey, do you mind stand up for a second? We stand back to back and they go, that'll work. That'll be great. And he leaves. And I'm like, that was, that was weird. He comes back a year, an hour later and he's black now. Oh my and, gosh. Yeah, and he has an Afro because he's going to be my stunt double. Oh, right. gotcha. there was a, so long story short, we became friends. The movie was oh over. He says to me, he says, Hey, have you ever thought about doing stunts? Um, and you know, you're athletic and everything. He said, There's a lot of movies coming in, there's no black Whoa. stunt man. Okay. And yeah, so I became the first African American stunt man. And of course, I work like crazy. Wow. Back then, every movie had a bad guy. Right. And guess oh what? Oh my gosh. Every bad guy was black. Right. And are you like the only black stunt guy at the time? The only one. Wow. So, I so you're just punch, killing I it. I was killing it. And, wow. Um, yeah. So that's that a tough the, world to get into. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You don't, that's, that's totally, what is that called? Nepotism. Yeah. It's all, it's all family. Yeah. You know? So how, there's, long, how long did the, you do that? Well, you know, that was the beginning of my career. I mean, I made a good career. Like I said, I mean, dude, I got stabbed, shot, blowed up. I mean, you know, OD'd, you know, every, I play, wow. I, every black, but I was it, dude. I was, wow. I was the guy. That yeah. is so awesome, man. And then I got some, you know, under fives because I could speak and, and take a punch and, and all that. And then one day, <laughs> one day I get my, my big, first big break. And they give, I get a lead in the show called Night Heat, right? In, in thing. And um, I was playing this psycho army guy running around with a freaking machine gun, uh, terrorizing this, this, this girl who was challenged. She was mentally challenged, oh right? Gosh. And I had no idea what I was doing. So it was one note. It was like, ah, let's go. Oh, the whole show. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? And it was like, oh my God, when I started, when I finally learned to act, I was like, oh, please burn every copy of that. Oh, episode. dude. <laughs> I love it though, man. And that just goes back to that, like, you just get it done. Like, you were just, get, that's a perfect example of someone who's just getting it done and just kept growing, dude. I love that. Oh my God. It was so funny. All right. So, listen, I'm having too much fun, but I want to respect your time. Let's change gears. We're going to do some rapid fire. Okay. Cool. Five things we didn't know. Okay. So, who is your favorite superhero? Batman. You get to be a superhero. You have a superpower. What would that superpower be, and how would you use it to change the world? I think it would be to effectively help people. Like, effectively, though. I mean, like, anybody. You put anyone in front of me, and I can basically uh, pop them out of their, their worst nightmares, you know? Wow. Biggest mentor in your life at this point? Oh, man, that's a good point. I mean, a good question. Because honestly, Maurice, mm -hmm. he's taken me, me he, he's helped me out quite a bit. Steve Burton helped me out a lot. Um, I guess at, at, also my ex-father-in-law, his mm -hmm. name's Andrew Banks. This guy is, he's really, really led me in a lot of, I, I go to him about a lot of things. Awesome. Favorite book? This book called 12 Against the Gods, uh, it's, it's specifically the introduction is about, about what we we're talking about, about physical stuff and, and how there are adventurers and it's about 12 adventurers and like one of them being Alexander the Great. And it's all about the adventure more than the actual, the, the treasure that you get. It's just about the adventure. Wow, I'm gonna check that one out. As yeah. a kid, now I don't know if you did or not, but as a kid, did you read? And and if so, what was your favorite book? Mine was like anything with big pictures, Richie Rich, <laughs> and the Curious George, you know. Yeah, I wanted to read so bad, and I just I just couldn't comprehend what I was reading. So it was comic books, and huh? and it's funny because I said Batman's my favorite superhero, but I haven't seen the new Batman yet, and I I don't know when I'll see it. But it's more like the original comic books and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that, that I really, that's the nostalgia that, that I go to. It's interesting you say, cause I, I haven't even, I'm going to about 
when we're finished here, I'm out, go uh, out with my wife on a date night. And we were talking about renting the fight tonight. It's going to be a great fight. But I was thinking, I actually thought maybe we'll go to the, see the Batman movie. So I don't know. Dude, if you do, you. let me know. I'm curious yeah. how it is. Yeah, I, I, it looks, it's always amazing. Um, okay. As far back as you can remember, what was your favorite gift you ever got? Who gave it to you? And why was it your favorite gift? So my uncle got me this little Buddha. It was this like ivory little Buddha. Uh, I guess there's two. So, and both, both were from my uncles and I, I was about seven years old. And uh, the other one got me this little plastic guitar, electric guitar keychain. And um, the Buddha, I think it just represented luck. It represented luck. And, and I was really into luck and kind of, uh, something magical when I was a kid, you know what I mean? I really believed that if you just prayed hard enough or if you had enough luck that things would happen. And so I think that just kind of had this magical thing. And then, and then the electric car guitar, I think, I think pretty young, there was this desire to, uh, to play music. And so I think those are the two that I remember the most. Yeah. Awesome. Now uh, I always like to leave our champions with what I call the action step, the one action step. So you're about to lay down the Marcus action steps. So the champions that are listening, if they put this action step into play right now, not, not tomorrow, not, Hey, that was a great idea. Let me, I'll get to that. But they put it into play right now. In your opinion, their life will start to go in a better and more positive direction. What would that action step be? You know, as boring as it sounds, I feel like daily walks mm. and you know, I, I'm up to like literally, I'll walk a long time, but I think even if you just do a 10 minute walk, I think there's something so powerful about forcing yourself to get out of your place, especially for guys like actors, you're in your apartment so much or your house, wherever you are. And I, and I feel like daily walks for me personally, I ju it just gets my mind going and, and, and looking around at my environment, it gets my mind in, in a good place. Mm, I love that. I love that. So Marcus, the champions, they want to know how can they find, I know you got music. You, do you have a podcast? You got a website. What's your handles on social media? Oh, thanks, man. It? Instagram, yeah. Marcus Coloma. Uh, and honestly that I guess Twitter as well. Marcus Coloma. Those are the, those are the two things. And I have a song on um, Spotify or all the, all the platforms. If you just, if you just put my name in, it's called hold on. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, champions, me and Marcus are so grateful that you spent some time with us today. Champions I'm giving a shout out to my single moms out there. I got you because God's got me. We're excited. Let's go change the world because you matter. You're important. You can do whatever you want to. We appreciate you. And if you could just like, comment, and share our podcast, it makes a difference. You can watch it on YouTube. If you're looking for some tips to help you on your journey, you can stop by my website, www.railandrews.com. So with that said, we are out. We'll believe in you till you believe in yourself. Make the rest of the day the best of the day. God bless. Boom. Thank you for listening. We hope our podcast helps you in your journey to walk in your power and create generational wealth. If you like the show, please don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, and leave a rating. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Real Andrews. Looking for more tips, tools, and nuggets to help you on your journey? Stop by our website, www.realandrews.com. Until next time, remember, take action. You matter. You are important. And you can do whatever you want to do.